Hello friends, we'd like to welcome you again to this very special series, Undaunted Courage. We'd like to welcome those joining us across the country and around the world. We know there are people tuning in from literally across the globe. And we are glad that you're part of this very special series focusing on three important truths. Creation, the authority of the Bible, and how do we share our faith. Well, this morning we have a very important presentation. Pastor Doug is going to be sharing with us this morning. But before we get to that... Let's start with a special word of prayer. Let's just bow our heads. Dear Father, we are indeed so grateful for the opportunity to be able to gather together and open up your word and study such important truths. Uh, There are people uh, around the world, Lord, who are searching for meaning, for purpose, who have many questions in your Bible. The Bible provides those answers. So we are indeed so grateful for that. Bless our time today, for we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd also like to remind you about our free offer for today. We have one of the amazing facts lessons. Thank you, Daniel. It's entitled Amazing Disciples. And this is our free offer for those who are joining us online. If you'd like to receive this, all you need to do is text the code or the word DISCIPLES to the number 40544. This is a premium gift. We don't often do this, but we're happy to provide it as part of the Undaunted series. Again, you just text the word DISCIPLES to the code 40544. You will receive a digital download of the book and you'll be able to study it at home. So we want you to take advantage of that. You will be blessed. Well, before Pastor Doug comes out and shares with us, we have Shauna, who will be bringing us our special musical item. Your name, 
and keep my eyes above the waves when oceans rise my soul will rest in your embrace for i am yours and you are mine i am yours and you are mine i am a child of god amen beautiful thank you so much a blessed sabbath to you we're so glad to see each of you here, especially the young people that are joining us here at the Granite Bay Hilltop Church for our Undaunted Courage weekend. It's more than a weekend, actually. We've been going since Wednesday and uh, talking about the priorities of the Christian life, dealing with themes of where did I come from, what am I doing here, and where am I going? These are some of the biggest questions in life, and, and I really appreciate the presentations. I don't appreciate all of them. Let me tell you why. Because when we planned this, we decided we're going to talk about creation evolution, and we're going to be talking about the importance of the word and sharing your faith, talking about the world, the word, and the witness. I said, great, I got some good sermons on any one of those. So I planned what I was going to talk about. And uh, then I heard the first presentation and it was on courage. I said, well, I guess I'm not doing that. But I've got time. So then I thought, I'm going to talk about creation evolution. I got some good stuff on that. And my friend and brother Clifford stole all my material <laughs> on that. So then I thought, no, nah, I've, I've got something that really, it'll encompass all of these things. This will be a good message. Folks will like that. And uh, had it all figured out, worked on it for a couple of days. And last night, I had missed the presentation yesterday morning, so I thought I'd catch up on the ones I missed online. And a brother, David Chin, shared my sermon <laughs> yesterday morning. So last night I said, Karen, will you pray with me? <laughs> I know I told her, I said, God has something planned. I'm not ever worried about that. But uh, this is something that literally I, I, I put together this study. I've shared it before. Uh, that I think goes well with our themes this weekend, but all the presentations have been really good. I can just see that uh, the Lord is leading, and uh, pray for me as I share with you. If you have your Bibles, turn to the book of Joshua. That would be the sixth book in your Bible, the book of Joshua chapter 2. And our message today is going to be talking about Rahab from fear to faith and courage. And while you're finding that, I'll tell you a little story about a rope. True story, young man, 16 years old, name was Homan Walsh, uh, Walsh, and he lived um, uh, near Niagara Falls back in about 1848. And they were trying to figure out a way to build a bridge across Niagara because many people died trying to cross the very powerful, you know, the rapids there are arranged, are arranged at a six-stage rapids. If you kayak, you know six is about as bad as it gets. And a lot of people trying to cross the Niagara Gorge. And back then, right now, a lot of the water has been re-diverted for hydroelectric. It was a lot more powerful than what you see today. And... Um, they couldn't shoot a rope across. It was too dangerous to try to uh, take it across. They had no helicopters back then. So someone came up with the idea. They said, you know, if someone could fly a kite far enough across, we could probably start building that bridge. And so Homan Walsh, he went over to the Canadian side to take advantage of the east wind. He got a great big kite that he had designed called the Union, very strong string. They had no fishing line like we have back then. And he flew it all the way across and they grabbed it, that 800 foot span, 200 feet deep. And from his string, they then attached another cord a little bit 
stronger and they pulled it across and from that cord they attached a rope and they pulled the rope across and from the rope they attached a thicker rope they pulled that across and then they attached an iron cable they pulled that across and eventually starting with that little bitty string they were able to build a suspension bridge over which buses and trains and millions of people travel started with a kite string so there's an amazing fact for you the string is going to come up again in our message today now you have it I suppose in the book of Joshua chapter 2 we find the story of Rahab now Rahab is mentioned three times in the New Testament she's a very important character both in the Old and the New Testament the children of Israel are camped on the borders of the promised land they've finished wandering for 40 years and before they're going to go over they really don't know what to expect because the only people that have laid eyes on the promised land in hundreds of years they spent all this time in Egypt uh, it had been a long time since, since Joseph or Jacob or any of the patriarchs had seen the promised land that's why Moses initially sent over 12 spies he said exactly what are we going to encounter we're going to run into war we need to know something about the landscape and the people and um, you know 10 of those spies lost courage that was also mentioned earlier in the week but Joshua and Caleb they believed now Joshua he is leading the people he's been filled with the spirit Moses laid his hands on him and he is the one who is both the the prophet and the leader the commander and it says Joshua the son of Nun sent out two men from Acacia Grove now that's where they were camped just across the Jordan from Jericho to secretly spy saying go view the land especially Jericho one thing you're gonna notice that's happening here is earlier when they picked the 12 spies they sort of used the democratic process and they ended up picking some that didn't have faith Joshua said I am gonna handpick these spies that we don't make the same mistake twice and I'm gonna send them out two by two two spies they were probably unmarried because it was a risky mission he didn't want to leave any women widows or children fatherless two young men one of them we believe his name was Salmon that'll come up later and he gives them some instructions they also probably understood some of the languages of the land keep in mind even as the children of Israel wandered through the wilderness they were engaged in trading with the caravans of the Amorites and the Ishmaelites and the others and so they knew some of the language of the people of Canaan so he picked two men that were the young faithful strong and they could probably communicate with the languages of the Ammonites those are the Canaanite inhabitants so he said go view land especially Jericho now Jericho is the main beachhead for them to enter the promised land it is the lowest city on earth and it's one of the oldest cities in the world it is down below sea level not far from the Dead Sea but it was the great gateway city in order for them to enter the promised land they had to establish a beachhead they had to conquer Jericho and the people of Jericho knew that and that's why they went to great lengths to build the biggest walls of any city in the promised land it was a fortress it was a great trading center Jericho is on the intersection of three continents it was the one of the most profitable places that you could be a tax collector that's why Zacchaeus was in Jericho and the last place Jesus went before he went to Jerusalem to die he went through Jericho but Jericho was like sin city matter of fact you've heard the parable of the um, the Good Samaritan that man was going the wrong way he was going from Jerusalem the city of God down to Jericho and he fell people leave the church and they go to Vegas they fall that's what was happening <laughs> and you notice it says he went down the man went down and he fell among thieves and going to Jericho so Jericho was a bad city matter of fact after Jericho was destroyed Joshua pronounced a curse on anyone who dared to rebuild it and during the time of King Ahab someone disregarded the curse of Joshua he went to rebuild the city of Jericho and the very thing that Joshua said would happen he said you will you will lay the foundation in your firstborn and you will set up the gates in your youngest when that man laid the foundation of Jericho his son died in some accident his firstborn 
And when he finished and he set up the gates, his youngest died. It was a curse. It was a cursed city. That's why Joshua said, I've got to conquer that city. So he sends two messengers. So these messengers, they come. I mean, the next verse here kind of catches people's attention. So they went and they came to the house of a harlot. Now right away you're going to say, wait, Doug, you said these were faithful. Joshua sends out these faithful men and how is it that they get so distracted on this business trip? They go to a harlot's house. That takes a little explanation. Uh, back in Bible times, they did not have hotel chains. And when people traveled, they would often stay in an, an inn. It was a family bed and breakfast. And they also offered other services that were very ancient in those places. So if your family operated an inn, they assumed that if uh, you were the lady of the house who owned the property, that you also provided other services. And so Rahab is called Rahab the harlot. And I'm not going to justify that, but the reason they went there was not for those services. The reason they went there is so that they could get intelligence because she had this hotel and it was in the gate. Quickly slip in, slip out. And they figured that there, there's all these travelers and caravans that are staying there. And that was the internet back then. They wanted to find out what is the word? What are people thinking? And the best place they gather intelligence was at the crossroads there at the gate. So that's exactly what they were supposed to do. So they came to the house of a harlot named Rahab and they lodged there. And we don't know how long they were there, but it probably wasn't very long before someone noticed, you know, these guys sound a little bit like they got that Hebrew accent. And I bet they're with the Israelites camped across the Jordan. Now I've got to give you a little geography so you know why they were so upset. The children of Israel were commanded not to make any peace treaties with any of the nations that occupied the promised land. He says, you will not make any peace with them. You will either drive them out or kill them. And it was pretty brutal. He said, you will just completely drive them out or completely wipe them out. He says, otherwise you will intermarry with them and you will compromise your faith. And that was the thing that Moses knew was the most dangerous thing, is if they began to compromise their faith. He says, little by little, you'll intermarry and you'll start adopting their customs and you'll forget about me. All it takes is one or two generations and people give up. And so the Canaanites knew that Israel was not going to make peace with them. Now, when you look from Jordan across the river, you've got the city of Jericho. And from the walls of Jericho, you could look across the river and you could see a camp of approximately two million people. Now, how do we know that? Well, we don't know exactly, but we know that Moses numbered the army and at one time it was 600,000 men that could fight. So you do the math and what does that mean as far as you got women and children, you got the old and the young, and they must have had about two million people. That doesn't go unnoticed when you got a nation of two million that's moving towards your property. <laughs> and the other thing they noticed is as they look from the walls during the day, there always seemed to be a big old mushroom cloud hovering over the camp of Israel, shading them during the day. They noticed at night when the sun went down, that cloud glowed and illuminated the camp. That was kind of spooky. And what really bothered them is every morning they would all wander out of the camp and they seemed to be able to find bread that had miraculously appeared during the night and bring it back. And they said, wow, they've got God with them. Middle of the camp, they had their temple and this Shekinah cloud came up out of the temple. And they knew that they said, that was our land. God gave it to Abraham. We are coming back. God's told us to come back. We're taking our land. You guys moved in while we were gone, but it's ours. We're coming back. So the city of Jericho is on high alert. You see what I'm saying? So they're looking out for potential spies that have come from the enemy. And so when they heard these two messengers talking, and maybe they had a little bit of a Hebrew accent, it said it was told the king of Jericho, two men have come here tonight from the children of Israel to search out the country. Now, I would like to start applying some symbols to this story that I think you can legitimately do. 
The name Joshua, do you know what the name Joshua is if you say it in uh, Greek? Jesus. And if you say Jesus in Hebrew, it's Yahshua, Joshua, same name. Same exact, exact, exact name. When Mary leaned over the little manger and she talked to Jesus, she didn't call him Jesus. She called him Yeshua. But you're reading the New Testament. It translated from Greek, and so it's using that pronunciation. And so, and by the way, I don't have a burden that people use the word Yeshua when they talk to Jesus. Some do. I'm not in that group. I figure you speak to Jesus in your native tongue. But uh, Joshua is a type of Christ. Before he comes to the land that has been taken by an enemy. Do you realize this world was made by the Lord? It belongs to Jesus. This is my father's world. The devil has moved in. Joshua is coming. And he is going to repossess what is his because he's purchased it with his blood. But before he comes, he sends messengers. So two messengers are sent from Joshua. Who do these two messengers represent? The two witnesses. The New and the Old Testament, the Law and the Prophets, the Word of God. The Bible tells us that it is the uh, sword with how many edges? Two edges, Ten Commandments written on how many tables? Two. These are the two witnesses are the Word of God. So these witnesses are sent, and they go to this home. And does the king of Jericho, who would he represent? The devil. He's the enemy, right? Does he know when messengers have come from Joshua into his territory? I was so excited to hear about a hundred young people that went out witnessing and knocking on doors. Was that yesterday? That's amazing. Do you think the devil knows you went? You bet he does. Do you think he was happy? No, he's not. Does he want to stop it? Yes, he does. And when these messengers come from Joshua into his territory, that king of Jericho is upset. And he sends soldiers to the house of Rahab. And it says, they, Behold, men have come here tonight from the children of Israel to search out the country. So the king of Jericho sent to Rahab, Bring out the men that have come to you who have entered your house, for they have come to search out the country. They're spies for Joshua. Then the woman took the two men and hid them. The Bible says, thy word I have, what? Hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. The authority of the word. You want to be kept from sin? What did Jesus use to fight temptation? It is written, it is written, it is written. Study the word. Man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. We need to take time in the word every day as often as you would eat. You need to feast on the word. I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. I found his words and I did eat them. On and on through the Bible, it tells us the word of God is more important than food. It compares the law of the Lord to honey and the honeycomb. And it just says, desire the sincere milk of the word. And the most common representation is called the bread of life. And so we need to be feeding daily on the bread of life if we're going to be successful as Christians. So the messengers come and they tell Rahab, send out the men. But the woman, verse 4, took the two men and hid them. And she tells more about how she hid them. But she goes in back and she tells the guards at the door, Yes, it turns out, you know, I got a like guess here in the hotel. There were some men that probably came in here. I didn't know where they were from. It happened as the gates were being shut when it was dark that the men went out. Where the men went, I don't know. But if you pursue them quickly, you might overtake them. You better run quick, go get them. But she brought them up to the roof and hidden them with the stalks of flax that she'd laid in order on the roof. Now, several things we got to talk about here. One is, uh, the Bible tells us that Rahab becomes a person of, of courage and faith. And, uh, but yet, uh, she told a big old lie. There's no way around it. it was, she just lied. Does that mean it's okay to lie? Some people try and use this as an argument to say, well, you know, they lied in the Bible, so it's okay to lie. If you're scared or if you're in trouble, you can lie. No, lying is always wrong. 
But it says Rahab, yeah, I know Rahab did something wrong. God blessed her because he winks at our ignorance. The Bible tells us that David lied. You remember when uh, King Abimelech was going to arrest David and David suddenly pretended he was crazy? He started to drool on his beard and scratch on the gates like a lunatic? That's called deception. He wasn't crazy. And often in battles, they would pretend they were being defeated and they'd run and they'd draw the enemy out and then they'd, they'd use diversion and they'd attack them from behind. I mean, you'll often see that in times of war, people use deception. It's not approved, but keep in mind, Rahab's a harlot. I mean, give her a break. She doesn't know everything yet, right? So, you know, God meets people where they're at. Uh, you almost have to admire her for being so quick on her feet to think about what to say. But why did she suddenly put her neck on the line to save these strangers? Read on, and it explains it. So, she hid the men with the flax on the roof. And I, I should probably say a word about that because um, evidently Rahab not only has a hotel and she's got other businesses, but she does dyeing. Many families would have other business, and she's dyeing cloth because later we find out she's got scarlet cord and it says she's got flax drying on the roof and they used to use flax to make rope. They still do today. And so she may have been dyeing flax red or making red cloth and red rope out of flax. Lydia was a seller of what color? Purple. See, you know that. But I, and I can't prove this, but you can't totally disprove it. But I think it's interesting that these men were saved because she hid them under the flax. Now, what color was the flax? only color given in the story is scarlet they were saved because they were under the scarlet though thy sins be as scarlet as the color of blood and she was she saved them anyway let's read on she says I don't know where they went run after them so the men the guards they pursued them by the road to the Jordan they assumed they had gone right back to the Jordan to cross over to Israel so the soldiers are chasing after these two spies that of course are still in the city and as soon as those who pursued them had gone out, the soldiers had shut the gate. In case they're still here, don't let anyone out. Now, before they lay down, she came back. In other words, they had to, just, they had to chill for a while. There's a lot of activity. She thought, if they're going to get out of here, we're going to have to wait until late in the night when it's quiet. So they lay down. She, le le she left things. She took care of the other guests. And then she comes up and talks to them on the roof. And it says, now before they lay down, she came up to them on the roof and she said to the men, listen to this. I know that the Lord has given you the land, that the terror of you has fallen on us. What was the attitude of the people of Jericho? They are scared. They are discouraged. You'll see that. The terror of you has fallen upon us, and that all the inhabitants of the land are faint-hearted because of you. For we have heard that she had, they had heard about the word of the Lord. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the waters of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt, and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites that were on the other side of Jordan, Shihon and Og, who you utterly destroyed. And as soon as we heard these things, our hearts melted. Neither did there remain any more courage in anyone because of you. All the people of Jericho are very discouraged. Why? Because they are in a city of destruction. They knew Joshua was coming, and he was coming with orders to destroy those cities that had uh, occupied their home turf. By the way, you know, Jesus is coming. It's not going to look too good in the world. All the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see him come. How many of you have read Pilgrim's Progress? The hero's name is what? Christian. And Christian is fleeing from what? City of Destruction. John Bunyan got that from this story, you'll see. And everybody was discouraged. Friends, if you are not saved, you've got a reason to be discouraged. I hope you are not on your way to hell encouraged. <laughs> right? If you're on your way to hell, I hope you're discouraged. But I am here to tell you how to be encouraged and to have undaunted courage. And the person here in this story that's got incredible courage is who? Rahab. What is the king of Jericho going to do to her if he finds out that she has now conspired with two messengers from Joshua? She has now become an enemy to Jericho 
she becomes the minority in the city and yet she's standing up in spite of her past she is thinking for herself and she says you know this city is doomed God is obviously with Joshua in Israel we see it across the wall across the river what hope do I have Rahab with her line of work all these different caravans would come and go through Jericho and she'd see all the different religions of the world keep in mind this is this is the the intersection of Asia and Africa and Europe goes through the Jordan Valley right by Jericho so she is acquainted with peoples and trade and religions from all over the world and she sees all these different people they're praying to their idols and nothing ever happens and they're counting their beads and nothing ever happens and they're they're wafting their incense and nothing ever happens and they're carrying around their good luck fetishes and their good luck bracelets and it, there's no power in that but then she looks across the river and they know the story of what God did 40 years earlier in bringing the children of Israel out dried up the Red Sea destroyed the Egyptians the plagues that fell on Egypt he fed them through the wilderness delivered them from the Amalekites water from a rock you see there were caravans bringing the news of what was happening with Israel during that 40 years and she said now there's a God my only hope is to make a covenant with the real God and she thinks the only way I'm gonna do that is if I make friends with the messengers she says this is my only way out and so she makes a snap decision she says these are messengers from Joshua I need to get to know them because that's my only hope and it's your only hope who do the two messengers represent the Word of God you need to get to know the Word of God and make a covenant so let's read on she said we heard about what happened when they dried up the Red Sea and then she makes an incredible statement here in verse 11 for the Lord your God he is God in heaven above and on the earth beneath the Lord your God he is God in the heaven above and the earth beneath for in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth and the sea that's an excerpt from the Sabbath commandment by the way now therefore I beg you swear to me by the Lord since I've shown you this kindness that you will show kindness to my father's house and give me a token give me a sign of the covenant and spare my father my mother now she's not just thinking about her own salvation she's got the messengers she's thinking now well, you know I've made friends with them but what about my family after you accept Jesus you start thinking about others and give me a token spare my father my mother my brothers my sisters and all they have meaning all of their families it doesn't mean all the stuff in the garage when it says all they have she's thinking about life right now make a covenant and save our lives from death they were under a death penalty and all of us are under a death penalty because the penalty for sin is death and we've all sinned your only hope is to make a covenant with Joshua amen And the men said, and this is the whole gospel is summed up in their answer, our life for yours. You know what Jesus says to us? My life for yours. This is the gospel exchange. He said, I will die for you. They basically said, look, you've put your life on the line for us. We will put our life on the line for you. Jesus said, if you want to save your life, you must first lay it down. God calls us to lay our lives down to follow him I heard just yesterday on the radio someone share an interesting story about this uh, six-year-old boy he heard the pastor say something about laying down his life and he, he told his mother he said you know I sort of know how that is mom she says you know how it is to lay down your life he says yeah he says every day when my little sister takes a nap you tell me that she can't go to sleep unless I seem to lay down with her so I lay down so she can go to sleep and once she's asleep I get up I'm learning to lay my life down <laughs> our life for yours if none of you tell this business of ours if you don't turn us in and betray us it will be 
that when the Lord, you notice they don't say if the Lord, they say when the Lord has given us the land, that we will deal kindly and truly with you. Jesus is going to deal kindly and truly with us. Then she let them down by a rope through the window, for her house was on the city wall. Now, where is her house? I need to ask this again. I want to make sure everyone hears this. Where is the house of Rahab? It's on the city wall. Her house was on the wall. She's got a window outside of the city, right? How else is she going to let him down? For she dwelt on the wall. Now, you know, God saves people that uh, are trying to get out of the city. She's as far out of the city as she can get until you're outside of the city. Some people are right in the middle of Jericho. They like it there. She was on the outside trying to get out. And she said to them, go to the mountain. They're going to be looking for you down by the river. That, don't go that way. Just go hang out in the mountain, lest the pursuers meet you. Hide there three days. Do we find three days in the gospel story? Hide there three days until the pursuers have returned. After that, you might go your way. So the men said to her, we will be blameless of this oath which you have made us swear, unless when we come into the land, you bind this line of scarlet cord. What color is the cord? Scarlet cord. In the window through which you have let us down. And unless you bring your father and your mother and your brothers and your father's house into your home, so it will be that whoever goes outside the doors of your house in the street, his blood is on his own head. We are guiltless. And whoever is with you in the house, his blood's on our head. We will lay down our lives to save anybody in your house. But if you go, they go out of the house, they're doomed. Because when we come, we're going to annihilate everybody in Jericho. I know that sounds brutal, but that's what they were told. When we come, everyone's going to die except those in your house. And we will put our lives on the line to protect everybody in the house with the red rope. Notice. And whoever is with you in the house, their blood will be on our head if a hand is laid on them. And if you tell this business of ours by which we will be free from the oath that you made us to swear, you can't betray us. She said, according to your words, so be it. She accepted by faith their word. She accepted this covenant and she followed it. And she sent them away and they departed. She let them down from the window by the rope. You know, Paul also escaped from a city in Damascus. They wanted to kill Paul. They let him out of the, let him out in the basket, which is a good reminder that God will save a basket case, right? <laughs> let him out of the window and, and Paul was saved that way. And they departed and they went to the mountain. And they stayed there three days until the pursuers return, returned. Now you wonder, how thick was this rope? This was not yarn. It wouldn't have held up those men. This is a, a strong rope. A scarlet rope. They were saved by that rope. Some of you remember the story in the Bible where a woman had twins. And uh, this is in the family of Judah. And when she's giving birth to twins, they always wanted the firstborn was very important. And they were struggling inside. And the hand of one twin came out first, and the midwife took and tied a scarlet cord. That was the first hospital bracelet in the history around the baby's hand but then the baby pulled his hand back in and his brother somehow wrestled into position he came out first but then the one with the scarlet cord came out and they said no technically the scarlet ribbon came out first and you know you find the scarlet thread all the way through the bible it's called the scarlet thread of salvation as a symbol for the blood of christ so they went to the mountain after they waited three days and they ate their uh, lunch he packed for them they then came down, they crossed the Jordan, they came to Joshua the son of Nun and told him all that had befallen them. And listen to what they said to Joshua, verse 24, chapter 2. And they said to Joshua, truly the Lord has delivered all the land into our hand. Indeed, all the inhabitants of the country are faint-hearted because of us. You know what the most important thing is in winning a battle? Courage. They army knows that the morale of the troops is one of the most important factors. If soldiers become demoralized, it's hard to fight your best. And they're telling Joshua, you know, it doesn't matter so much that they've got the bigger walls, they've got the smaller courage. 
we are more encouraged. They are discouraged. I think it was John Wesley that used to say, it doesn't matter how big the dog is in the fight, it matters how big the fight is in the dog. And in the Christian life, God wants you to have that undaunted courage where you're willing to follow your master and trust him and risk all for him. These two spies, did they put their lives on the line for Joshua? And did God take care of them? He did, and he will you. Now, several other things happen here, and I don't have time to go through uh, all of this, but I, I, want to, um, I want you to jump to chapter 6. And while you're finding chapter 6 of Joshua, let me tell you in my own words to conserve some time what happens. I'm hoping the clock up here is wrong. So, Joshua gets a message from the Lord. He says, the day has come. Tell everyone to get the camp packed up. We're heading into the promised land. Joshua gives the order, and the, the trumpet blows, and they, they get the camp all pulled together, and um, they get the priests bearing the ark out in front. And there were probably 12 priests. You had three on each pole, one for each of the tribes. And it was, a, you know, it's a gold box. It's got rocks in it. It was heavy. And so they march out in front of this procession of two million. Now the people on the walls of Jericho are watching this. They see a dust stirring in the camp of Israel. And they see them all form up in this massive parade. And then they see them start marching towards the Jordan River. And they're all looking at each other thinking, what, they think they're going to walk on water? The river is flooding. You need a ferry to get across. It's springtime. You can find out studying this story. And they said, what are they going to do? Well, the priests get down to the edge of the Jordan, and Joshua said, forward. They had learned faith finally. You know, when they came out of Egypt, they said, we're not going anywhere till you part the sea. So God had departed first when they came out of Egypt. But now, after 40 years of following the Lord, Joshua says, forward. They looked at each other and said, oh, here we are, carrying an anchor, and we're going to walk off into the water. We're going to trust God. When you trust, when God tells you to do something, you just trust Him. If He tells you to cross a mountain, he will move the mountain. If he tells you to cross an ocean, he will part the ocean. You will walk on water. He will give you scuba gear. Something will happen. You just do what God says and watch how he works out the miracle. So the priests go and they start walking off in the water. As soon as their toes touch the water, the floodwaters of the Jordan coming down from Galilee stop like they've hit a great big glass wall. They just stop and they start to pile up. It keeps getting higher and higher. And they walk off and as their feet step before their feet touch down, it dries before their feet. Not only did God stop the water, it says he dried up the ground as they're crossing over. And the priests go off in the middle, and they're told to stand there. And then God tells the rest of the children of Israel, all right, pass by the law as you make your way into the promised land. We will all someday pass by the law to go into the promised land. We'll give an account. Every man will be judged by the law of liberty. We'll give an account for every deed that has been done. Those sins that are not confessed and under the blood of Jesus, not good. So all of Israel passes over, and, and you can just imagine if the people of Jericho were scared before, now they see the Jordan stop running for the children of Israel. All the soldiers on the walls of Jericho, their knees are like, they went, oh no, this is not good. How do you fight that? And then, you get to chapter 6, they all cross, they take out 12 stones, they set up a memorial, and the river then, it's, you know, big old wall of water. Finally, after the last priest gets out and the last rock is taken from the memorial, the water goes kaput, like big old tsunami washes down to the Dead Sea. So now, it says, verse 1, chapter 6, Jericho was securely shut up because of the children of Israel. <laughs> you think? If they were on orange alert before, they're on red alert now. Now, what was Rahab doing in the interval? Rahab is told, only those in your house with the red rope will survive the coming of Joshua. Rahab is going around and she knows persuading people to come into her house is life and death. Do you know people need to be in Christ and in the church when Jesus comes? 
If you know that only those that come to Christ will be saved when Jesus comes, how motivated should you be to get people to come to Christ? I mean, you need to be tactful. You need to be kind. You need to be persuasive, though, and uh, be passionate. And she's telling everybody, you see Israel, they're going, yeah, this doesn't look good. You want to know how to live through? Yeah. Come to my house. I'll tell you how you can survive. I've got a red rope in the window. That red rope in the window is going to be your salvation. That's the blood of Christ. Amen? Amen. And they said, that red rope, that's all? You trust in that red rope. I've made a covenant based on that red rope. And everybody in my house, the servants of Joshua, like when the angels come for Jesus, they're going to gather together all the elect, right? The servants that come from Joshua are going to protect us when the judgment comes. And one by one, people start knocking on Rahab's door. And uh, <laughs> Rahab, who had at one time a terrible reputation in town, suddenly becomes a source of salvation. Do you know, who did Jesus first reveal the resurrection to? Mary Magdalene, who had a similar reputation to Rahab. And she's the one who starts telling others that Jesus is alive. And if God could use Mary and Rahab to be witnesses, share your faith, then can he use you? And so Rahab's house became a very busy place. And she probably evicted all the guests that didn't believe in the red rope so she could make room for those who did. And all of a sudden, instead of it being a bed and breakfast, it becomes a place of salvation. And she's spending all this time. And after the children of Israel cross the Red Sea, she's really motivated now because now she's got signs that Joshua's coming as soon. Do you and I have signs that Jesus is coming as soon? So God tells Joshua, okay, they camped there by Gilgal. They're on the other side. They're in the promised land. First thing they've got to do is they've got to conquer Jericho. God says, Joshua, I've got some interesting uh, military plans. As a matter of fact, it's a first. I want you to get the whole army together, 600,000 men. I want you to march towards Jericho. We're going to get the priests out front. They're going to blow seven trumpets. I don't want a single man to utter a single word. Just march in unison. Boom, 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 boom. We're going to circle the city once and come back to camp. And then we're going to do that for six days. How many times did they march around Jericho? People always say seven times. Thirteen times. They march around the city one time for six days, then seven times on the seventh day. Right? How many people were at the Last Supper? Thirteen. What does that mean? I don't know, but I just always look for connections in the Bible. <laughs> It, I'm sure it means something. <laughs> so now the soldiers on the walls of Jericho, they see the army's coming and they say, okay, everybody on the walls, get your weapons, get your bows, get your arrows, spears, ready for defense. And the army, this big parade, 600,000 men go boom, boom. They're not saying a word. You know, sometimes soldiers march and as they march, they chant. <laughs> I won't tell you what those words are, but they, they say things. I used to be in military school. <laughs> anyway, so they, but these guys, silent. No battle cry. No battle drum. They've just got the thump of their feet, and then these seven trumpets, the priests are blowing. And they start coming, and they think, okay, ready, ready. But then they make a right turn. And then they go around the city, just outside of bowshot. They say, and they completely circle the city, and after one circle, they go goodbye. They go back to camp. And they're all going, what was that all about? Joshua says, okay, next day, same thing. Here they come again, blowing the trumpets. I think they get a little closer this time. March around the city one time. No one says a word. Then go back to camp. Every day this happens. The courage 
among the people of Jericho is going down. Very, the stock market crashed, I'm sure, in the city. And you know what's the same time their courage is going down, you know what's happening at Rahab's house? You got any more room? She said, well, yeah. She opens the door, and there they are with all their suitcases. She said, we've got room, but not for that stuff. You can come in. We are willing to save the people, but we can't save your stuff. We've just got room for people in here. Some people want to get into the kingdom with all their junk. Day three, they march around the city. <laughs> day four, day five, day six. Seventh day, Joshua says, okay, you guys watch me carefully. We're going to march around the city. This time, six times we're going to circle the city. Don't utter a word. Now, these guys have been resting their voices. They couldn't wait to yell. And he said, after you get around the city, Six times, and I think every time it's like a snake coiling. They got a little closer, like a shark circling its prey. It says, I want you to stop and face the city. The trumpets are going to blow, and I want you to shout, because God has given you the city, and everything in the city is going to be destroyed. The goods in the city are put in the treasury of the Lord. All the people are going to be destroyed. The only ones who are going to be spared are the ones. And you notice, by the way, it says here in verse 10, Joshua had commanded the people, saying, You shall not make any noise with your voice, nor a word proceed out of your mouth. They march around the city. He says, Only Rahab, this is verse 17 of chapter 6, Only Rahab the harlot shall live. She and all who are with her in the house, because she hid the messengers we sent. Thy word I've hidden in my heart. By the way, where did she hide the messengers? On the roof. That's called the upper room. You got an upper room. And so the children visible surround the city. And Joshua blows the trumpet for the last time. And they all shout. Now I read somewhere an interesting, amazing fact. That the, the loudest noise that was ever recorded at a, um, a stadium was in 2014 it was in the stadium in the Arrowhead Stadium in Kansas City Missouri and the Kansas City Chiefs were playing against the Patriots and when they won the game the noise was so loud I guess there was some phenomenal touchdown that was made it reached 140 decibels which is about the si sound produced by all the engines of a jet taking off. And they say that it was so loud that they had seismic experts inspect the building afterward and the building had been damaged by the sound of the people roaring. So you get 600,000 men who've rested their voices for a week. And you say, okay, guys, let it rip. Shout, and the trumpets blow, and they shout. I don't think it was the decibels of the man. I think there were angels that knocked down the walls flat. And they all went into the city. As the dust settled, they noticed that all of the wall had fallen except one little section. You know where that was? The, any of you ever driven cross country when um, there's a, a, a farm, a ranch that's had a fire and the ranch burns down. The only thing left standing is the chimney. You ever seen that before? When the dust settled, there was this silhouette of one little section of wall that was still standing. Because where was Rahab's house? In the wall. And in that wall, there is a window with a lot of anxious faces and a red rope. The Bible says in Psalm 91, 10,000 may fall at your side and thousands at your right hand, but only with your eyes will you see and behold the destruction of the wicked because you have made the Lord the most high your habitation, neither will any evil befall you. There might be destruction all around us, but God will protect us when Joshua comes. Does Revelation talk about seven trumpets? Does the Bible say that the Lord will descend from heaven with a what? A shout and the trump of God. 
And the Bible tells us that the cities of the Lord are broken down by the presence of the Lord, by his fierce anger. Jeremiah chapter 4. There's going to be an earthquake, so great and so mighty an earthquake that there never has been. The story of Rahab and Joshua is the story of salvation and Jesus coming. It tells us that our only way to make it is to make a covenant with the Lord, to be under the blood. Amen? You know, we, uh, the soldiers went in, probably the, Joshua told the two spies, he said, look, um, go into the harlot's house, verse 22, and from there bring out the woman and all that she has as you swore to her. Keep your promise. Joshua keeps his promises. Amen? Jesus keeps his promises. And the young men who had been, they had no photographs. They're the only ones who knew what she looked like and the address. And the young men who had been spies went in and they brought Rahab, her father, her mother, her brothers, and all she had, everyone in the house. And they brought her and her relatives and left them outside the camp of Israel. But they burned the city and all that was in it with fire. What's going to happen to this world when Jesus comes? The elements will melt with fervent heat and the earth and the things that are in it will be burned up. Seeing then, friends, that all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons should we be in all holy conversation and godliness, looking forward to the day of God, in which the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved. God is calling us to make that covenant with Joshua. Now, I can't prove this, but um, after Jericho was burned and uh, two spies probably talked to Rahab and said, uh, all right, well, thanks for saving us. And she said, thank you for saving us. And uh, they said, well, what are you going to do? I think one of them named Salmon. She said, well, I don't know. My house is gone. The city's gone. Uh, he said, well, why don't you hang out with us? Now, the Bible does say she's still with us today in Israel. The time the book of Joshua was, was written, she was still alive. You read in the Bible, and it tells us that Salmon married Rahab. I think he may have been one of the spies. And Rahab and Salmon had a boy named Boaz. And Boaz had a boy with Ruth named Obed, who then had a boy named Jesse, who had a boy named David, the king. And Jesus is the son of David. And if you look in Matthew, you're going to see that the DNA of Rahab was in Jesus. Because the whole story of salvation is in that story of Rahab. Furthermore, the Bible says Rahab is an example of how to be saved by works. That's right. James says Rahab is an example. We're not saved by works. But of doing good works because of faith. And then Paul in Hebrew says Rahab is an example of how we are saved by faith. So it's interesting, Rahab is used as an example of salvation, doesn't matter what your extreme is. It's faith and works. And she became a mother in Israel, went from one reputation to being an ancestor of Jesus the Savior. And it's all because she had that red rope in the window. You know, I remember hearing an interesting story in history. In 1932, some sailors in San Diego were landing a blimp. I mean, it was like a Zeppelin. They used them. They were experimenting with them back then. And it took a hundred men to hang on to these anchor lines, these cables that came down from blimp. They'd grab the cables and they'd walk it over and they'd dock it. They'd park it. And they actually got video footage of this online. But yeah, I don't know if you want to watch it. It's rather disturbing. But uh, they ended up, a uh, hundred men got a hold of the, the blimp called the Akron, the U.S. Akron. And they're walking it over and something happened in the atmosphere where there was this terrible atmospheric updraft. And the blimp began to rise and started pulling all these men off the ground. And enough of them had sense to just say, well, you know, once you got a couple feet off the ground, it kept going up because I'm letting go because this might end badly. And most of them let go. Some let go a little late and like they sprained their ankles. Some may have broken their legs, but it kept going up. And three of them thought it's going to come down quickly, but it didn't. It kept going up hundreds of feet. Three men were hanging on to this rope uh, for dear life. Their names were Robert Etzel, Nigel Henton, and Charles Cowart. 
And Robert Edsel was the first who, though they were all young, strong sailors, you can only hold on so long. His arms started burning, and he lost his grip, and he fell and died. Not long after that, Nigel couldn't hang on any longer, and he lost his grip, and he fell and he perished. But Charles, he realized, you know, I can't hold on to the rope, but if the rope can hold on to me. And so before his arms got too weak, he held on with one arm, he took his free arm, slung the end of the rope around his waist, and tied a primitive knot. And he was able to hang up there indefinitely, because now the rope was holding him instead of the rope, him holding the rope. Friends, Jesus has lowered a rope of salvation for you. You need to wrap it around you. You need to wrap yourself up in the promises of God, accept the blood of Jesus, because Joshua's coming. The trumpets are going to blow. There's going to be a shout. There's going to be an earthquake. There's going to be a terrible judgment. And there's only one way out. You need to be under the blood. You need to be in Christ, in, among his people. Before we close with prayer, you received a card when you came in. I'd like you to pull it out and take a look right now at your card. It's asking four questions. Right now is the moment when you, if you've not done this before, you can accept Jesus and know that you're in the house of Rahab, a house of salvation. I want to repent of my sins and surrender my life to Jesus. Only way we can make it is by trusting him and laying our lives down for him taking up our cross and following him and he will save you maybe you're considering you've not studied these things but you'd like to study the word and you're interested in baptism you want someone to contact you we'd like to make that possible for you please indicate that put your name email phone your cell phone or your email on there both would be great and no matter no matter even if you've done this before I hope you'll all check I want to surrender of my repent of my sins and accept Jesus if you like more Bible studies please mark that some of you are thinking about lives of ministry whatever your career or college is you think I want to also learn to minister you want to go through the AFCO program and it'll set you up to be a worker for God and whatever your field is you're interested in that let us know and we'll tell you how to plan for that program you know as you're filling out that card I'd like to just pray with you right now and um, ask God to work in your lives Father in heaven, we're, we're thankful for the um, truth in your word, the story that you've provided a means of salvation, that while circumstances in the world right now are very discouraging, for those that know Jesus, it is very encouraging because we know how the story ends. We know that Jesus wins. And Lord, we want to be on the winning team. We want to be under the blood when Jesus comes. I pray there's, if there's any young people here that have been holding off making that surrender, that now as they hear your voice, today they will come. They won't hesitate, and they'll accept Christ. Please bless them to make that decision, encourage them, and then I pray you'll give them that undaunted courage because Jesus is their Savior. In his name we pray, amen. After you filled out your cards.